So what is something you are willing to believe in without having seen it? Think about that for a minute. Yes? All right. To believe in God, even though we can't see God. That's a good point. Good. Good. Yeah? All right. Hang on to Jesus. We can't always see. That's right. But we know we can hang on to Jesus. This is good. I expect that those things that we need to believe and we can't see kind of depends on who's telling us about them, doesn't it? Kind of depends on the source of who's telling us about them. When I was growing up, my little brother told fantastic stories about a bird he thought he'd seen, he believed he saw it, that he called the blonde-haired crow. <laughs> now, we're going to have a picture of something like that, I think, in a minute. Now, the rest of the family hadn't seen this. My parents spent a lot of time talking to him about honesty and truth-telling. That appeared to work because he's grown up to be a fairly trustworthy person. But suddenly, I came across a picture of yellow-headed blackbirds, and I wondered, wondered if he had really been telling us the truth all those years ago, after all those arguments about the blonde-headed crow not being real. The rest of us weren't there when he saw what he saw. Now, we might think of today's reading as the Doubting Thomas passage, when Thomas questions what the rest of the disciples are saying, that Jesus resurrected appeared to them on Easter evening. In other words, last Sunday night. Thomas wasn't there, though, for that appearance of Jesus after his resurrection. But a week later, like tonight, Thomas ends up in the same room with Jesus resurrected, and all Thomas asks for is exactly what Jesus gave to the other disciples, so I'm not sure he deserves the label Doubting Thomas. They ask for the same things. Jesus, though, is the center of this passage, not Thomas's doubt. It's not touching Jesus that leads Thomas to faith. It's Jesus offering himself. Jesus is ready to give anything Thomas needs for him to believe. He's even willing to give up his life. Let's think about when this Gospel of John was written as well. It was the latest Gospel written, probably very late 1st century, maybe early 2nd century. So it was written when most of the people who had walked with Jesus when he was on earth had gone on to their heavenly home or were about to. So it was written to second generation believers, this story of Jesus appearing resurrected and his care of his disciples. The Gospel of John also doesn't have any account of Pentecost in it or the arrival of the Holy Spirit except this one, Jesus sharing the Spirit, breathing the Spirit on his disciples. I think we have our question back to the great schism answered. In this, though, Jesus re reveals the choices his disciples have to make. Will they receive God's unlimited love through him and have their sins forgiven? Or will they reject relationship with God and struggle on their own with their sins, too proud to lean on God? That's the choice Jesus gave the disciples back then. It's still the choice we have today. Do we choose God's love and having our sins forgiven? Or do we insist on going it on our own, reject God and struggle hanging on to our sins on our own? If we don't turn towards God and forgiveness, is it because we don't believe God wants a relationship with us? Jesus came to share our whole human experience, even the most painful parts. And I expect the reason we struggle with accepting that kind of love from our God, from Jesus Christ, is that maybe nobody else has ever loved us that much.
Remember that song we heard on Good Friday, even if you weren't here, I'm sure you know it. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh, sometimes that causes me to tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? The verses of that hymn go step by step by step through what happened in Jesus' crucifixion. And it's sung usually very slowly to make us think about what happened to Jesus, what he was willing to do for us, the pain he experienced for us. That song can make us tremble all these years later when we put ourselves there at the cross in our mind's eye and our emotions. So we tremble when we think of what happened on the cross. That song was first printed in 1899 in a hymnal called Old Plantation Hymns. And there is that verse that's even in our hymnal that says, were you there when they nailed him to the tree? That happened to enough slaves on plantations and lynching that would happen to enough descendants of slaves that this song continued to resonate through black Americans for generations to come after it was written. Because the experience of targeted discrimination is felt by many in many parts of our country and many parts of our world. Targeted discrimination can be specific to race or gender identity or body type or social class. When human beings choose to hurt each other, it's through things that can feel very personal. And most of us have been there at some time in our lives, feeling pain in our human experience. Many of us have had times when the sun refused to shine, or at least it felt like that. And we need to be reminded that Jesus is with us on those days that the sun seems gone and our world slips into darkness. A Good Friday experience that we have at different ways at different times in our lives. And that's a lot to think about, especially when we think about all the divisions between people in our world today. We have differences in which... We get our information from different sources and we have different ways we respond to that information and when we differ, we don't always respond with respect. Sometimes we use our differences to hurt someone else or deny their experience has happened. We've heard of Holocaust deniers and we say, let's never forget that. But now in our country, we're working on how to speak of of history in our own country because we've had different experiences based on race and gender and social class. We need God's help to hear each other's different experiences, all of our different human experiences, because everybody carries a part of our human experience in whatever you've witnessed if you were there. Some of you have heard me give the example of what happens when somebody falls downstairs at church, in a church with more stairways than this one. As the pastor, I'll go and talk to the people at the top of the stairway and ask what happened, and they'll tell me what they saw. And I'll ask the people at the bottom of the stairway what happened, and they'll tell me what they saw. And those are often two different things. And then I'll talk to the person who fell, and there will be yet another piece of the story. And it will take putting all of those pieces of the story together to really know what happened. In today's scripture passage, the new life for us in this season is in the relationships of those disciples so long ago. Thomas was able to say he didn't believe the other disciples, and those other disciples are able to accept that Thomas doesn't believe them, respectfully. As far as we can tell, 
they all acknowledged they were in different places of belief about Jesus' resurrection. Those who had seen believed, Thomas had not yet seen and did not believe. The other disciples didn't attempt to persuade him that he had to believe or tell him he was less than a disciple or he didn't tell them they were crazy either, as far as we know. So this doesn't turn into a scriptural example of gaslighting, as we put it today, in terms of somebody not believing the other and insisting that their reality isn't true. And then Thomas was provided with what he needed for belief, and his own encounter with the risen Christ simply came a little bit later. In the months ahead, right here in this place, we're going to consider our experiences of being a church based on following Jesus resurrected and what that new life means for us. Let's look for what we share in common about that, what this following Jesus experience is like that we have in common because we'll each have our own relationship with God, our own relationship with what we believe about Jesus, as well as our own relationships with the church and each other. May we find our commonalities and strengthen those, but may we also respect our differences and decide what to do about those. Many times, the differences we have between us are a signal that we need to learn more about each other. With God's help, let's do that with courage and love rather than clobbering each other and walking away. I trust we can walk the journey of learning from each other with love here in this place. If we trust Jesus to guide our next steps, that's what will happen together. Let's walk the journey in his name, finding new life in all the ways that we can. Amen.